Welcome to a new episode of Measurement Meshup, the podcast about data-driven decisions in communication. As always, we talk about corporate communications and how we can make the effectiveness of comms activities measurable and visible. The podcast is for anyone involved in communications or PR who wants to learn more about how communication can be measured. We believe that data can make a big contribution to improving the position of the communications department in the eyes of top management. In this podcast series, we want to talk about how to make this happen in a very practical way. My name is Stefan Rufenach, and virtual with me is Mark Steffen Buchle. Hey, hello. I'm Mark Steffen Buchle. And first of all, ooh, nice intro, Stefan. <laughs> I have the pleasure of spending the next few minutes with you. Today's topic will be on reputation. What is about which insights we can get and a little bit about challenges and hurdles. We are not alone discussing this. We have invited a comms expert to join us. Dennis Larson is with us. Hello, Dennis. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot for having me. I've really been looking forward to this and uh, look forward to chatting with the measurement mashup maestros. So honored to be here with you today. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Just a few words about you. You are a real institution in reputation management. You have like 20 years of experience as a management consultant focused on strategic reputation management. You're a managing partner of the Reputation Inc., a consultancy in, headquartered in London, advising clients around the world in areas of strategy, communication, reputation. And in the beginning of your career, you have worked with Professor Fumbrom in the emerging field of reputation management. Uh, Fumbrom later founded the Reputation Institute, which is one of the dominating players in the world on reputation management today. And together with him, you wrote one of the first books on reputation management, which is called Fame and Fortune. But in addition to this impressive biography, you are active in a number of professional organizations, let's name it board member of the European Association of Communication Directors, practice fellow at the Nordic Alliance for Communication and Management, and regular lecturer at executive programs at leading business schools. And last but not least, and this is very exciting and important in these times too, director at the Council for a New Economy, focusing on circular economic development. You know, it's it's been a great journey so far. I feel really lucky that I could start early in my career working with who are often called the founding fathers of, of the field of reputation from an academic perspective. Charles Farnbrun and, and Professor Case Van Riel, who set up the Reputation Institute, they taught me so much and I learned so much from uh, also working on academic research and indeed the, the book uh, um, that you mentioned, Stefan, fame, fame and Fortune. Dennis, you, you live and, and work mainly from Oslo, um, even though the company that you're a partner with uh, is located in London. Uh, tell us a little bit um, about about that. Um, so how where are Scandinavian companies in the whole reputation measurement uh, field? Some some are pretty savvy. I mean, there are really excellent companies. Uh, uh, think about the the energy sector, the also, but also in 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 fish and animal nutrition. I see companies really taking uh, proper time to explore issues uh, that are going to be impactful to them in in the me medium term and in the, in the long term, and thinking broadly about their reputation, thinking about. Uh, Uh, what expectations their stakeholders will have in time. But the, but there are differences to the approaches depending on different geographies you look at. And um, I think here in Scandinavia and in the Nordics, I do see a lot of opportunity for kind of mid-size or SME companies, but also public sector organizations to take a more fit for purpose approach and a more strategic approach to reputation. Because indeed, traditionally, the field of reputation in this kind of market has been seen as kind of synonymous with PR and but we're seeing uh, we're seeing the field growing up and we're seeing a more strategic approach emerging. Before we delve deeper into the topic let's uh, briefly define for our listeners and us what reputation management actually is. How would you define it and what does reputation in core mean for you? Has this developed over time for instance? Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a good good place to start, and I think that there are many different definitions. And depending a little bit on what your lens is into thinking about reputation, uh, you might see it in a slightly different way. So, for instance, if you're uh, from economics or accounting, uh, you'll have a slightly more asset-based perspective. 
to what reputation is, looking at reputation as per- perhaps an intangible asset to the business. Compared to, say, experts in branding and corporate communication, uh, they'll see reputation more from the space of uh, perceptions and uh, evaluations audiences make of companies. But, I mean, to keep things simple, I think there are three components or three perspectives that are essential to distinguish and to explore when you're thinking about reputation. There's something about awareness, uh, number one two, assessment, and three, asset. So these are three different ways of looking at it. So maybe if you look at awareness, it's about perceptions, right? The general impression stakeholders have of a company. Um, you might think of um, what, what you've read or heard in the news about a company, say recently AstraZeneca, and have a general view of you know your perception or your impression of AstraZeneca. The next one is then assessment. Here you're making more of a judgment. So you might have a particular value judgment you make of a company like AstraZeneca based on the kinds of things you've seen or heard. And I imagine here, for instance, with yourselves in Germany, you might have a different view of recent events when it comes to AstraZeneca than, say, someone in the UK. You'll have a different judgment uh, based perhaps on your own value systems and what you care about. And there might be a a national um, uh, component to this as well. Finally, the asset view, as I mentioned from economics or or accountancy. Here, though, the reputation is seen as something that has intrinsic strategic value to the company. So it makes business sense to build the right kind of reputation because it helps businesses attract and retain the vital resources that influence their future business success. And that's where the relational components comes in, attracting customers, attracting people who want to work for you, uh, attracting uh, suppliers even uh, from procurement perspectives that will give you favorable trades of business, uh, creating the right environments and the right license to operate with engagements with regulators, for instance. So there are many different approaches depending on different kinds of stakeholders. And of course, those awareness uh, assessment and and asset perspectives overlap. You know they're not mutually exclusive, but in essence, keeping it simple, you know, boiling it down to its core, I'd say reputation is about the the perceptions and future expectations stakeholders have of organizations, companies, or other organizations. And the key thing here is to think about reputation for what, for what topic, right? Among which mm-hmm. stakeholders? So among whom? and compared to who else. Those three things are essential because you have different reputations for specific topics and issues. You have different reputations depending on who's doing the looking, right? This old saying of beauty is in the eye of the perceiver. That's exactly the case here with reputation as well. I think maybe we have to explain if there's a listener that listens to this podcast in a year or in two, why you picked the example of the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca because there's a big discussion around uh, the vaccine that they have put on the market uh, with regards to COVID. And so maybe that, that will be forgotten in, in a year or two <laughs> years' time. But it's also an interesting aspect, right? So crisis situations and how can they um, how can they impact reputation overall? But let's go back to the basics. Um, I already mentioned the book that you have been um, helping uh, put together um, in 2003 uh, with Fumbrom, Fame and Fortune, How Successful Companies Build Winning Reputations. That's the title. It's still on Amazon. I checked uh, yesterday. What's in this book? Is it still is it still relevant? Would you still recommend people to buy it and read it, or is it all outdated? Has the reputation business changed since then? It's interesting you ask because actually I found myself uh, now coming into 2021 thinking maybe there is space for something new, and I'm actually exploring with with other academics. Perhaps uh, there's there's a market or an interest in a refresh, not of that particular book, but a new look, a new practical and academic merged look at what strategic reputation management really is. Because I think absolutely the the concepts from fame and fortune are still relevant. And, you know, flashback to uh, to, to the early 2000s uh, when I was fortunate enough to be involved in um, uh, in, in putting it together, sort of in the background, doing all the analysis, looking at the implications of reputation for business success and doing all the data analytics and all of that. I mean, I learned so much from that process and I'm, I'm forever grateful to Farnburn and, and Van Riel for allowing me to be involved in that. But when I look at the book again now, I go, well, there's 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 still relevance. The The theory still makes sense. Perhaps, you know, the case studies are outdated and would need to be updated. But there's also other 
components that I would feel currently would be relevant to embed in such a book, such as reputation governance, uh, how do you uh, hold uh, the right parts of the organization to account for reputation moving beyond corporate communications? Uh, how do you ensure reputation risk is uh, a, um, a continuous uh, part of the board board level discussions? How do you ensure that the entire organization has at least some understanding of the thinking required at every decision point of the reputation implications, which has learning and development implications and more cultural implications for organizations. And of course, so much has happened in the last almost 20 years now since the book came out uh, when it comes to digitalization uh, and new uh, approaches that are being taken from a, a stakeholder engagement perspective, new tools and techniques that are relevant. Things have, of course, accelerated so much, which has meant uh, the approach to reputation management uh, has moved into different arenas in the business as well. But uh, the core is the same and the reputation measurement on itself, it's common, it's common sense. We are still talking about surveys of, of stakeholders uh, whose attitudes are captured. By a, by a statement set. Yeah, I like to think of it as, as reputation intelligence, which is kind of measurement plus. So indeed, uh, the, the, the core or common approach is often kind of primary listening, uh, surveys, in-depth interviews, focus groups and the like, which is still a very important part of understanding your reputation, both measuring your reputation, but then also going beyond the numbers and understanding really what is going to um, change people's not only perceptions, but what is going to change your stakeholders' willingness to support you, to support your ambition, to support your agenda. And that requires um, uh, discussions, in-depth conversations, uh, which probably organizations already have having, but are they capturing in the right way? And with the dawn of everything that's possible on um, uh, natural language uh, processing and, and AI enabled techniques, we suddenly have very powerful tools to understand where is the discourse going, uh, to test messages, to understand where are potential reputation risks when you look at media and social media analytics. So that is a new component or relatively new if you're look, comparing the last two decades. Uh, and we're seeing companies really embracing technology to understand reputation risks and reputation opportunities in, in better ways. Um, and, and when you say models, I think Indeed, uh, there are good academic core models of what reputation is, and then there are me measurement methodologies that are still applicable. Um, but I'm I'm more and more convinced that, I, I mean, I'd actually like to see there being as many models almost as there are organizations. So the point being that you wouldn't go to, say, say McKinsey or big management consultancy and say, Where's where can I take the, the best strategy model and plug it into my organization? It's not really an off the shelf approach. And my whole premise has been throughout my career that reputation is of such strategic value. You shouldn't also, in that perspective, take the off the shelf model and approach and apply it. That's not to say you can't learn from, you know, and I was involved in that research in good academic models and, and the science, but that's evolved over time as well. Uh, so having a good mix of listening to what are the best approaches methodologically to measure reputation. And some of them indeed include online surveys, tapping into panels, tapping into omnibus surveys, but really tailoring it to where are your stakeholders? Where do you and, engage with them? What do they care about? And taking a more tailored approach to that. And to use individual reputation dimensions for your company, for your organization, specifically, individually, and with a lot of methods, with quantitative methods like surveys based on statements, for instance, with qualitative uh, measurements like uh, focus groups, with uh, deep dives into data via Amazon reviews or social media discussions, and to, to combine all these data to develop an uh, individual reputation model. I think this is the core of it all. That's where we're seeing organizations extracting the most value from it. And you're also seeing that in developing their own reputation model with leadership ambition included in, connected to their business strategy, 
they can then plug that model into other existing ongoing metrics. They can plug it into social media media monitoring. They can plug it into internal survey works, maybe not in its entirety, but the core pieces of it. You have always companies that do a lot of work in measuring consumer sentiment or customer satisfaction surveys, but embed some of the key reputation model components in there. And then on an ongoing process, uh, in an ongoing way, integrate and report on the on the findings regularly so you have more real-time data coming in this leads us to the discussion on indices people talk about ah uh, we have we have a re reputation score of 42 okay which is based on what the others have for instance 43 but what have we now to do what can we learn from that i think that's that's not the point Yeah, I think to a certain extent, it's helpful to have an aggregate overall number and to have a stretch KPI and a target. And if you set that as kind of the North Star somewhere to go to, but make sure that that, that number you pick is something that you have involved your company into designing the data that goes into that. So you're not holding yourself hostage to just one external index or one external ranking or one external rating because you'll have less impact on that and it's it's if if you haven't designed it and it's not company specific you'll have a hard time explaining to your board why you're not reaching 43 if you're 42 that said there's a lot of value in looking across relevant indices rankings and ratings to understand uh you know where you stand on core aspects of your business that are important to your stakeholders but don't just hold yourself hostage to one and when you and when you do aggregate your own reputation data from all the your own surveys and and other data points coming in it, it does help to have an overall stretch target but then break it down into components so you can really be clear on the pieces that you actually can impact on and some of it might be impacted by government relations, some of it might be impacted by uh, procurement or by compliance in specific topics with specific stakeholders. And it might all aggregate to one overall number. And of course, you need benchmarking and stretch targets to push the needle and incentivization around it. But if that one overall number is based on, you know, something you have less control over, it's a fallacy. And I think the other point in, in KPI setting that's important to bring in here is this idea of um, what McKinsey called surrogation, right? So often you see in many of these KPI setting processes that the the metric or the KPI is, uh, is confused with the strategy. So for instance, when you look at uh, consumer satisfaction surveys, if you're geared towards you know, the maximum consumer satisfaction, maximum consumer satisfaction, your system might be suboptimal because you might just be annoying consumers by continuously asking them to rate you. And we all get these ratings, ratings, ratings. Why aren't you giving me a five? And it actually maybe takes away from consumer satisfaction because you're bothering so, them so much on the data. I mean, that's a simple point, but the same Uh, applies to reputation. So don't confuse the importance of the strategic value of reputation with a singular focus on uh, on the indicator. I think it's great that we summarize this a little bit because I think a lot of confusion that I see with clients comes from the fact that they're seeing these indices floating around. There's the Reputation Institute who publishes uh, one and there's Millard Brown, you know, like there's, there's different companies who measure your reputation and that sometimes there's this perception that okay there's i'm already being measured so i can just take that number and that's the number but then in the end i mean what fi what companies finally want is they want to move the needle right so they want to see okay so now i bought this report i now know that my reputation score is 42 or whatever um so how can i now turn this into 45 latest at this point you would ask yourself okay this index is now based on informed public. So they conducted an, a survey about the informed public. What about the other stakeholder groups? And how can I even move the needle with the informed public if that's such a broad and wide uh, audience there? Um, mm. So so I, I, I think it's very important um, what you stated there, Dennis, to say uh, there is no out of the, sh like off the shelf solution. You really need to think about what data to use. Uh, where does it come from? How often do you want to measure? Also, don't overmeasure, um, obviously. Um, but then you can also really move the needle, right? So you can you can say, hey, this is the number now. Can I can I derive action steps to bring this number up? Uh, maybe you mm -hmm. see 
bad reviews on Amazon, as, as Mark mentioned. I mean, that that's now very tangible. Now it's not a number anymore, but you can really like take this one area and say, hey, that's where we're going to start uh, improving our score. Exactly, exactly. And a lot of the data, whether you want to be or not, you're, you're likely, if you're at least uh, of a certain size, you'll likely um, have some indices, rankings and ratings that you're already that you're already on. Uh, so it can already be a simple source of some indication of where you stand. But I think it's, as you're saying, extremely important to look across the relevant rankings and ratings and not hold yourself uh, hostage to just one. Use them strategically as an input but also as a way to signal to relevant stakeholders uh, what your values are and what your company is all about and, and play that rankings, ratings and awards management game strategically. Um, and when it comes to measurement and, and insights, the more you can construct your own data from all those existing sources, combining it with your own insights, the more successful you'll be. The problem slightly is that You'll always get, you know, your your CEO knocking on the door saying, why aren't we, you know, number number at least in the top five of best place to work indices, or why aren't we on the on the top brands in brand Z or or top rep track in our countries and so on. And you have to have an answer to that if you're in corporate communication. You have to understand these models. You have to perhaps maybe you will pick one that is part of your core measurement construct, and there's good value in all of them, right? But really you need to understand which one has most value to you. If you're a B2B company, perhaps there is less relevance of um, understanding what your reputation is among the general public in some of these rankings and ratings. But maybe there is an influence of certain publics that will already influence your other stakeholders and you do want to gain visibility and improve your reputation among segments of the general public. But pick the right rankings and the right indices that really match where you're going as a company uh, and then use those data points strategically um, as part of your inputs, uh, but also as part of your decision making work, but combine it with other data. And you'll already have a lot of data in the business. We often forget different departments do their own studies and pay attention to different data sets. But we also often forget that actually we can do a lot of internal work before we go off and commission another external st study because your employees, they're in contact with the stakeholders. You can listen to them and understand what are the issues that come up in conversations? What are the expectations our stakeholders have of us in that uh, ongoing dialogue we have with them? Uh, and then perhaps there might be gaps to fill. You might have to commission some additional research, but maybe you have enough from all the existing sources that are available. And by really listening to your uh, to your relationship owners within the business and doing some internal uh, measurements, which tends to be cheaper and easier to do anyway. Yeah, then it's a very important point. I think this is where you start to control or steer corporate communications when you get as always, a little bit deeper in your data and you see and you understand how your model uh, works. In, in, and then you see all these uh, steering opportunities, the adjustments that should be presented via the management board. So this is, this is the point where we can work on uh, optimizing corporate communication processes, optimizing stakeholders, Uh, how we deal with them and all this stuff. I think that's important too. That it is not the point that you have an, an index or something like this. It is the point that you see all these factors and all these models are working together. Exactly, so exactly. Cool. And um, I think in, in what is the role of corporate communication when it comes to reputation measurement? And reputation management is, is a question that often comes up in organizations. Um, I see corporate relations and corporate um, communication functions really being stewards of the process. I mean, the whole premise is that we understand issues. We understand multiple stakeholders. We can gather the right insights through the right methodologies. We can integrate data points uh, that are also being gathered by the marketeers and by investor relations of specific stakeholders and so on. But then we should not as corporate comms be held to account for all of the reputation data. We can't own that. It has to be owned by the business. So we can steward it. We can nudge the business in the right direction. Some and many, by the way, reputation solutions and reputation risk mitigation actions can't be solved clearly 
by communication alone. Something might need, need to be changed. And I've seen lots of great examples of how corporate communicators have taken reputation data, nudged the business to actually change a product line, extract themselves from certain very risky behaviors, because increasingly CEOs and C-suite executives understand how valuable reputation is. And when you ask them, what's the biggest risk to your business? Reputation risk always in any study you look at comes in the top five and it increases over time. So I think there is a piece and various pieces, as you say, of reputation measurements and reputation intelligence that can be owned by corporate communication directly be impacted. Think about specific stakeholders, corporate comms tends to have the more direct influence on. Could be if you think about public affairs, the regulators, the policymakers, could be uh, the media, et cetera. Uh, it could be other, other stakeholders that we more directly have an impact on, but it's the what and the who. So certain topics we might have more direct relevance to influence and we can use some of the reputation deep dive indicators as KPIs for our corporate comms departments. But taken as a whole, other components of course need to be taken into the business and really empowering this corporate relations uh, function and corporate comms to have business savvy discussions with the data. They need to understand analytics. They need to understand reputation risk and uh, the, uh, the way to take that data into the business to inform better strategies and better decision making. That's, I think, the power of good reputation. Yeah. And this is this is the point to get business impact when you use it like an early warning system for your core processes, for your customer relation management, for your main stakeholders that are important in your business area that you are or business phase that you are in in these times for instance astrazeneca you 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 named it what what do you think uh, steffen yeah um so I, I like what you say, Dennis, um, and I think it's reflecting um, what I see also in, in surveys, um, that, that reputation is always among the, the top priorities. However, when you, when, when, when you really look into what companies are doing in certain situations, and we are in a crisis situation right now, then, then you often also hear, uh, you know, yeah, reputation, it's not our biggest priority right now because we have to deal with uh, disruption in our industry. There's digitalization. We are, our sales are going down. We're, we're in this pandemic. There's lockdowns. Da, 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 da. Reputation management is not our first priority right now. So obviously, when confronted with certain situations, budgets are being cut in reputation management, um, and it, it's considered to be a PR exercise still. Um, that's that's my feeling. How do you argue with, with this um, when companies are in crisis situations? I think if the consideration of leaders is that reputation is about PR, then um, they're not really understanding what strategic reputation management is all about. And perhaps there is still in some corners a reputation problem for reputation because of that. Um, uh, I'd say that only CEOs that really take the long term view in considering the impact of exactly short term decisions, especially in crisis situations. Think about the impact on multiple stakeholders about on their employees. They, only those businesses will really succeed in properly guiding their organizations through disruptive forces. And I, and I know, of course, because of covid, we've we've seen companies take some good value based and ethically correct decisions to secure safety and security of their employees, uh, to secure safety and security of, of, of clients and other stakeholders, and really proactively see how their organization can start to help being um, a solution to certain aspects of the problem. You know, we've seen companies uh, do all sorts of work to have proper impacts on local societies with uh, providing uh, logistical support, providing hand sanitizers, et cetera. So uh, th that was in the early stage. And I think companies that actually think reputation, whether they actually call it reputation or not, but think long term, think multi-stakeholder um, uh, and take the right decisions are those that will uh, prevail and, and will succeed. And, and we're seeing also companies that have perhaps taken some wrong decisions and forced employees to come back to work even though the government guidelines said perhaps you need to stay at home and that's a reputation risk to make that kind of decision right so i think thinking properly about the reputation implication of how you handle especially short-term crises uh, will be increasingly important 
And in this time, I mean, there are companies, you already mentioned it, who obviously did well in the pandemic. So reputation is on the rise. I've seen examples where beverage companies would donate alcohol from their production for hand sanitizers and stuff. Uh, so obviously you wouldn't even think which industry sectors play an important role in crisis like this. But one industry that has also profited immensely from this is the pharma industry, obviously, right? Um, what's your impression of that? Yeah, I think we've seen, of course, it's a big topic, but the pharma industry has had uh, reputation legacy issues. And, and we know there there is a slight deficit there compared to actually the good they do in society. And they've been trying to build up a renewed, better reputation. Uh, I think we're seeing a positive, with, when you look at indicators and data, you're seeing a positive effect on the broader healthcare, but also uh, on most of the pharma industry as a result of COVID. We're seeing an increased understanding of the importance of this industry in our lives, uh, existentially really, uh, and uh, and that has led to improved trust and improved reputation uh, for the industry as a whole. But of course, and we talked about AstraZeneca before, and there's so many issues that are influencing perceptions on how individual companies are handling uh, handling the crisis, and with that comes uh, uh, the AstraZeneca conversation on uh, that's currently live, uh, which is of course perhaps having a slight dent on their current reputation in certain markets. But a lot of that is also fueled by the political discourse. I mean, the the UK ban of export of AstraZeneca vaccines to to Australia, the whole. Uh, arguments between the EU and the UK on the export ban claims with AstraZeneca in the middle. These all have implications for the reputation of AstraZeneca. Maybe some of that will be short term, but also could have an impact on the reputation of vaccines themselves, which then have an impact on the industry. I mean, there is a lot of work still to be done uh, on the reputation of vaccines themselves. Uh, and we see we've seen in Australia uh, protests against vaccines, uh, uh, which have had to been uh, commented on by the government. We saw at the end of the Australian Open, uh, you know, a positive comment uh, by, by by officials saying, OK, soon we'll all be vaccinated and we'll get back to normal. And then w with booze in the audience. Right. And then the government had to step in and, and say this is disgusting behavior. So there's still pockets of an anti-vaccine protests so that the entire vaccine uh, um, uh, uh, industry needs to work on reputation overall. And but there's an opportunity in the meantime. Uh, you mentioned the hand sanitizer for for companies, whether they're in uh, farm or healthcare or not, to uh, use their communicative excellence to stimulate at least with their em employees, but also with other stakeholders to stimulate people to take the vaccine to to um, uh, look at boosting. Uh, the, the return to normal as much as possible. And I know, I mean, when you look at, at Germany, for instance, big, well-known, quite reputable companies such as BASF and, and Bayer are doing what they can to stimulate their employees to take the vaccine, right? And to, and to take over some of the distribution logistical problems that the government has had. And there's even talk of, you know, because I know in the in the German marketplace, you're able to pay people bonuses if they take the vaccines. And even by companies like Aldi and Lidl in the States, and these are big German companies in the States, they're doing this, you know, they're paying employees $200 each to take the vaccine. So we're seeing interesting approaches. And I think companies that rise to the challenge, step up, do the right thing, uh, can help uh, take away some of the reputation deficits that the vaccines themselves had. But there's a much broader conversation indeed on pharma and pharma industry reputation, which uh, if they play the game right, individual companies will come out stronger and ride that wave of increased public um, trust and public understanding of the importance of their role in society. Super interesting point, Dennis. I think we could talk for hours and hours about this stuff and the reputation uh, impact. I have in mind, let's do another episode on this in detail and let's see some charts and figures and some data on it. But you mentioned another important topic, the employees. Employees are most important, I think, most important stakeholder group, for instance, for ambassading and to, to, to push reputation in external audiences. Well, what's their role in reputation management from your side and with your experience uh, on the companies that you uh, analyzed in the last years? 
Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up, Mark Stefan, because I think there's that's really where a lot of the untapped potential lies for many organizations. And you tend to see when people come into thinking about reputation, they think first external. I mean, it's natural, right? We work in corporate comms and we want to get the right message out. We want to boost external reputation to attract customers and so on. But there's so much untapped potential from, from the internal perspective. And with that also comes implications for measurements, right? We often have HR running big uh, employee engagement surveys and we have maybe some internal comm surveys. But why not ask employees more and more, what do you think we should be doing on these big societal issues? What do you think our reputation is? Where are the pain points? How should we address some of the issues that you know are coming up in your discourse? Your employees are experts. Tap into that knowledge from a measurement perspective. And then indeed, as you say, make sure there is um, a good awareness and understanding um, by decision makers of the importance of taking reputation implications into account a priori in the business decision making process. So you're not taking business decisions and then, oh, oops, we did something wrong. Corp comms, can you help us fix this and help us look better? No, build reputation the way you would think about HR, you think about finance, you think about all your market implications, build reputation into that decision making. Your CEO says it's important. They care about reputation risk, but um, they also uh, say, well, actually, we don't know really how to build this into the business. So that's where you as corporate comms can really play a role, partner with learning and development, put together coaching programs, training programs. It can all be embedded in your organization. I'm seeing a lot of potential there and a lot of organizations are investing adequately. And there's a good return on investment, investing in really developing sufficient knowledge and skills across the organization. Um, for instance, uh, uh, I've seen companies build a simple reputation 101 short e-learning module into their onboarding program for new managers. All managers have to have this base level understanding. And then you might have some deep dive expertise that you build into specialist areas, you know, even different departments like compliance, like risk, like uh, procurement. What is their role in reputation management? So start to embed it into the philosophy of the business, the culture of the business. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And then you start to see the role, not just of ambassador, the ambassador effect, but you build it into the ethos of the people's day-to-day -day work, where they're thinking about the implications on different stakeholders uh, beyond their singular focus uh, uh, in, in, in their day-to-day -day work. What I like about what you're saying there, Dennis, is also that there, there's another point where we see that data might already be there or surveys might already be there. So companies don't need to reinvent the wheel. They can use what's already there to start. Because I also sometimes hear from, from clients that they say, yeah, reputation management, another boil the ocean uh, approach here that doesn't bring us anywhere. But I think it, it, it's important to understand a lot of what you need in terms of data is already there. The surveys are there. The tools might be there. You, you need to bring that together and maybe ask questions in a different way or you know, ask additional questions uh, so that you get like more information. Um, but it's maybe an easy step um, that you can already do. Exactly, exactly. And I think that is really a good first step to look across different data sources that you already have access to, look into what other external third-party reports, industry reports, uh, where you stand on rankings and ratings. You'll have a lot already. And then there might be some gap filling needed um, and then uh, look at where the leadership wants to go. What's the company's strategy and how does reputation fit in? Great. So I think we are almost at the end of our episode here. So let's wrap up a little bit. We talked about a lot of things. Let's keep it tangible. Let's assume you meet um, the CEO of a new company, a small company, doesn't have huge budget. And now he asks you the questions. Can you give us advice of what we can do to start out? Um, what what could you recommend a company like this? Yeah, and as I would normally say to the, the business school students and indeed new uh, new people I speak to, whether they're in corporate comms or, or leaders in other functions, I think it's it, it, the first tangible step is to just start internally to have discussions with colleagues with leaders, get a sense of what reputation means to the business. 
And perhaps the word reputation doesn't work. I mean, in many markets, it, it perhaps is synonymous, as we were saying earlier, to to PR. And there's nothing wrong with PR, but it, there's a piece and a place for PR. And reputation is something more than that. So it might be, as I've seen in some other companies from a pharma perspective, they think about trust. It might be corporate brand. And you can infuse those discussions with reputation thinking. Start having those discussions internally and explore where does the reputation concept live? Perhaps you already have initiatives in in trust building, in compliance, in corporate branding that you can leverage and that you can build into a broader strategic reputation approach. But it's about having those internal conversations. Then step two, look at what data exists. You know, don't go out and, and buy a report yet. You know, look internally first, what exists? What are you currently doing across different functions where there's perceptions from stakeholders coming in, there's expectations from stakeholders coming in, there's survey data, there's online media monitoring, whatever it is, start there. Um, then use that, once you know a little bit where you currently stand, use that to start to set an ambition with leadership. It could be leadership of a function, you can start there, or it could be the entire business. What is our reputation ambition? What are the things we know we need to be seen as and known for and, uh, and, and have a credible position for in order to achieve our business success? Have that ambition discussion with leaders. And then, only then, do you set your model up and do you make sure that you're integrating all the incoming data, perhaps doing some additional measurements to understand continuously where you stand on reputation. And then you can do neat things like take a quarterly reputation risk, mini report to the board. You can have reputation embedded into, into uh, uh, other functional work. You can set up a culture program. A uh, you can work on compliance. You can take the data where it points to change needed, but make sure it's part of the regular ongoing reporting cycle in the business. And some companies that are maybe more um, um, uh, more sort of geared towards data and KPIs and so on. They embed reputation from a KPI perspective into the corporate scorecard. They build incentivization around it. Other companies take different approaches and have more of a, a reputation council and look in depth at specific issues and brief their CEO and leaders on issues that are coming out of the research. So there are different approaches, but I think those four steps, one, internal conversations, two, go through existing data you have, Three, set the ambition. And then four, continuously look at the data and insights to inform business decision making. Do you think that there is the need for a specific role or function in the company that could do these four steps? Traditionally, I've seen corporate relations and corporate comms perhaps playing that stewarding role, as you could call it. So they might be the ones better placed to own the process of gathering the insights and the data and reporting into the business on that and then pushing the business into certain directions based on what the data says. But that means that that function perhaps needs to have sufficient analytical capabilities and needs to have access to the data. It might be you have, as some organizations have, um, a, a, an insights and measurements practice, which could sit within marketing or, or, or other departments. So, so you have the measurements components and the Uh, the analytical components, which can be in-house, they can be outsourced, but it's more, it's really important to make sure it's embedded into the structure of the organization at the right level. And it has to be towards the top of the organization, part of the ongoing C-suite agenda, part of board reporting. Because don't forget, uh, it's increasingly being uh, seen as a business leadership imperative uh, to, to take account of reputation. And in some markets across the EU and indeed in the UK, it's becoming mandatory for directors, non-executive directors and executive directors to show how they are taking multiple stakeholder considerations into their into their decision making, moving from a singular shareholder focus to a multiple stakeholder focus. And that's exactly where reputation sits. Great. So much for today. Thank you, Dennis. What an, what an interesting discussion. Um, I agree fully, Mark. We, we could talk for hours and let's do that. I think the, the idea to, to maybe have a separate episode on the pharmaceutical industry and, and all the uh, effects that play a role here on the reputation, that, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Um, thank you, Dennis. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to chatting again. 
We are looking forward to our next episodes in the coming weeks here at measurementmeshup.de, your podcast on data-driven decisions in communications. We hope you liked the show and will join us again next time. Thanks a lot. I'm Marc-Steffen Buchele. Und hier ist Steffen Rufenach. Vielen Dank. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Thank <laughs> you.